we are in a study through 1 Thessalonians, and we are stuck at verse 1, where Paul says, grace and peace to you. I told you last week, and if you've not watched last week's uh, lesson, I encourage you to just go ahead and push pause, go back to last Sunday's lesson on grace. It's called God's Amazing Grace, um, so you can kind of get caught up with where we are. But I told you last week that I was going to skip over that verse, and God said, no, you need to slow down and dig deeper and go wider and study grace and peace in a little more detail. This is a salutation that Paul uses in every letter that he writes to one of his churches. Uh, he offers them all a blessing of grace and peace. Year, many years ago, there was a, a church conference and there was a very intense discussion going on around the probably the fellowship hall about what was unique about Christianity. And C.S. Lewis was at the conference and he came in late and and you know picked up on all of this, you know, because you know how these discussions they start kind of calmly and then then people get a little more intense. And uh, somebody said, Well, we're we're arguing about the uniqueness of Christianity. And Lewis said, that's easy. It's grace. Uh, yeah, that's a good word. And last week we studied the story of David and Mephibosheth as an illustration of God's saving grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it, salvation, is the gift of God. It is grace that awakens us to God. I, I could have used the, the hymn Amazing Grace as kind of the outline for these studies because that verse that says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." He's talking about it is God's grace that awakens us to our need of God, that teaches us to fear. And then it is grace that lets us know that Jesus paid the price for our sins and relieves our fear, and that grace appears to us. Whatever happened, whatever set of circumstances that worked together, that caused you to turn to God, was a working of God's grace. And by the way, a lot of us are praying for people who are outside of Christ, a good prayer to pray is that God will send people into their lives who will be a positive influence toward God. You know, there are a lot of people who aren't finding their way to God because they don't know anybody in a, in a close relationship that knows God. And it's good to say, Lord, send some people into their lives, maybe on the job, maybe a new neighbor, maybe it's some you know, organization they're a part of that knows God and will be a good illustration of your grace to them. At the same time, Lord, keep away from them those people that would drag them away from you. So grace is essential to our salvation. By grace you are saved through faith. But grace provides more than our salvation. Grace provides what we need for our daily lives. It's the verse, again, from Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Man, I tell you, when we sing that song at my long-term care facilities, and I see these saints of God singing, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Boy, there's a whole lot of stories in those words. But it was grace that has brought me safe this far, and it's grace that will lead me home. And so I have entitled our lesson today, Grace Will Lead Me Home. There are some things that grace does for us after it leads us to salvation. First, I grow more like Christ through grace. We have talked in recent weeks about God requiring us to be holy. The Bible term is sanctification. What that means is we become more like Christ. It is an ongoing process whereby we become more like him. That is possible through grace. Listen to Titus chapter 2. 
starting in verse 11. They, these references I put in the notes today, and so if you'll look in the comment section or the description section, you have a link, download the notes, you can follow right along with us. Titus 2 verse 11, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, which is the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is God's grace that gives us the power to live a holy life. It is God's grace that gives us the power to say no to sin. I think a lot of times we think that's all up to us. And certainly we have a responsibility. We have a part to play. You know, it's kind of foolish to say, Lord, uh, lead me down into temptation and then hang out with people that you know are going to tempt you and go places you know are going to tempt you. You know, we, we need to sing that old little children's song, be careful little eyes what you see and be careful little feet where you go and be careful little ears where you, what you hear. Um, we, we do have a responsibility not to be silly or stupid, you know, with trying to say, oh, I'm a strong Christian. I can go back to the places that used to drag me into sin. No, don't do that. But on the other hand, we do not become more like Christ by gritting our teeth and scrunching up our face and groaning and grunting. No, it is the grace of God that gives us the ability to say no and to grow more like Christ. Second, I serve God and reach my potential through the power of his grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, you know, I used to persecute the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, I have reached my potential and I am serving God because of his grace. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. In Ephesians 3, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4 that we should use whatever gift we have received to serve others as a faithful steward of God's grace. Whatever abilities and gifts and spiritual skills that God has given you are a result of his grace. And as we use those to minister to other people, to help in his work, any benefit that comes, any reward that comes, is not because we're so skillful, but it's because he's so gracious. It is his grace that enables us to serve him. It is his grace that enables us to shine as light in the darkness when we don't feel like shining. You know, some days you just don't feel like shining. Some days you want to say, why do I always have to be the bigger person? You know, why do I always have to be the one forgiving? It's God's grace that enables us to serve him and serve others even when we don't feel like it. Third, and I'm going to sit here for a little bit. We are able to endure suffering because of God's grace. We're familiar with Paul's passage in 2 Corinthians 12. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I asked the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore... I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And then I read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, 
firm and steadfast. That is an incredible verse. Some translations don't include the word himself in that verse, but it's there in the original text. And it means that God himself personally is interested in supporting his children through the trials they're going through. Let me read, I mean, I know that verse is in your notes. You look at it again. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, will himself personally restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. There are things that God does through his angels. There are things that God does through other people. There are things that God does himself. And I love the fact that yes, even when we're going through suffering, he may send some people along to encourage us, and he may send some angels to minister to us, but behind it all, God is himself supporting us. What an incredible truth. What will he do? He himself will do four things. He will restore you. That word means to fit together. It's the idea of an adjustment, putting things in right relationship. It was used in the medical field of setting a fractured bone. It was used by fishermen to describe the process of repairing their nets and putting everything back together. I love that. God will restore you. He will put you back together. Huh. I'm sure some of us have had times in our lives we've looked at the mess we were in and the mess we were and wondered how in the world we'd ever get back to any kind of sanity or any kind of connectedness. God restores lives in the midst of suffering. It is his grace that mends and repairs what has been broken. And you may whether you're at home or here in the room, may be able to say amen to that. God has mended the broken places. I went through suffering. I went through crushing. I went through dislocation. But God himself has mended me. Then he says he'll make you strong. Some translations use the word confirm for that. In other words, he will allow you to have your mind made up to be constant, to not be wavering. One Greek scholar said it means to make you as solid as granite. I think he's referring back to Matthew 7. Build your house on the rock, that no matter what comes against you, you can be strong. You can have your mind made up. It is God's grace that makes you better, not bitter, when you go through suffering. And, and let me just stop right here because it was about at this point of my study when I thought, yeah, but that doesn't happen for everybody. You know, we all know people who went through suffering and became bitter. We all know people who went through suffering and ended up far away from God and hadn't been back to church since. What makes the difference? Because it's not automatic. Because it was automatic, everybody that was a Christian that go through trials would end up on the other side of the trials in better shape. That doesn't always happen, let's be honest. And as I was thinking and meditating on that, I, I feel like God led me back to that passage in 2 Corinthians 12. When Paul says, when God told me, my grace is sufficient for you, I made a decision that I was going to rejoice when the difficulties came. Not because I'm a spiritual masochist, but because I know that God's grace is sufficient. And I think that what makes the difference between people who go through suffering and draw closer to God, and people who go through suffering and pull away from God, is the decision we make during the suffering. Somebody told me one time they had just gotten 
some news from a doctor that was going to impact their life. And they said, I just want you to know that I have made the decision that it doesn't matter what happens, I'm staying true to God. I think that's the key. Because sometimes when people suffer, and they're going through difficult times, sometimes it's, you know, it's understandable because sometimes it's just so emotionally draining that you don't feel like going to church, you don't feel like reading the Bible, you don't feel like praying. So what happens is we start to pull away from those things that keep us connected to God. We're going through difficult times. Maybe we're a little ticked off at God that we're going through these times. But for whatever reason, we, we stop listening to praise music and, and we stop reading the Bible and we stop you know, doing any devotional reading and, and, and we stop praying and we're much more sporadic in our church attendance. And then we wonder why it seems that God's so far away from us. Let's make a decision that when the tough times come, with God's grace, we're going to come out on the other side of it, still connected to God, still committed to Him, still serving Him. I think that's the difference. It's the attitude of being receptive to God through the difficult times. Again, the human tendency is pull away. You know, like the old Quaker who prayed, God, I know you don't have a whole lot of friends, and seeing how you treat the ones you do, I understand that. You know, sometimes it's like, God, you're supposed to love me. Why are you doing this to me? And instead of causing that to cause us to pull away from him, when the suffering comes, let's draw close to him, and he will make us strong. The third thing it says, he will make you firm. That word means to fill you with strength. And give you the ability to stand. What is it when we go through trials that gives us that ability? That we are filled with strength. We have strong convictions in our lives. It's the grace of God. As we stay in a position of receptivity to his grace. And then he says he will make you steadfast. That has the concept with it of laying a foundation and being grounded. I like that. When we go through suffering and we keep ourselves in a place of receiving God's grace, we become grounded. Suffering has a tendency to, to just blow away all of the fluff, doesn't it? You know, if we're not, if we're honest, so many times what we call worship is just fluff. And, and when you go through suffering, it gets rid of the fluff. When you go through suffering, it gets rid of all the extraneous stuff. And when you go through suffering, if you stay connected to the grace of God, eventually you get down to the foundation. And you get grounded. And you're able to sing, On Christ the solid rock I stand. Everything else is non-essential. Everything else is fluff. But when you get to the place where you have learned that you can trust God, even in the darkest times of your life, that is a gift of God's grace. After you've suffered a little while, now I know this is not going to encourage you because some of us think we've suffered a whole lot longer than a little while but you know when you compare it to eternity it's just a little while again Paul 2 Corinthians chapter 4 we do not lose heart though outwardly we're wasting away yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fixed our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. I know people who have suffered decades. Doesn't seem like a little while. When you compare it to eternity, 
It's just a little while. And we've got to keep our focus on the eternal. God is working in us for the eternal. Stay strong. The God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory. And so don't forget that part of 1 Peter 5.10. God has called you to his eternal glory. You're going to suffer a little while down here. But God, if you will stay connected to God and receptive to his grace, he will restore you, he will make you strong, he will fill you with strength, and he will ground you in your faith. I call that the, great, the grace to finish. Its grace has brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. It is God's grace that enables us to go through the challenging times of life and stay connected to him. Fourth, grace should flavor our relationships. I mentioned to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Chuck Swindoll had an interesting thought on that verse. He says, I think a corollary of by the grace of God, I am what I am, is by the grace of God, I will let you be what you are. <laughs> you know, So many times we want everybody to be like us. And he says, no, it's the grace of God that allows us to accept other people with their own idiosyncrasies and their own individual uh, quirks and things. And it's necessary to draw on God's grace in those relationships. In the, in the health field, a lot of times, we talk about families being high touch. That is, they need some extra hand-holding. They need a lot of reassurance. They need, you know, everybody on the staff needs to go see them every day. You know, they're high touch. In church, we call those EGR. Extra grace required. <laughs> Y'all know any of those people that are extra grace required? Well, Paul says we can have God's grace. Colossians chapter 4. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Ephesians 4, let no unwholesome talk, that word means talk that tears down, come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. Not puff them up, build them up. As I was thinking about that, grace and our relationships with other people, because when you study the amplification of the words for grace in the Bible, you find that it does carry with it the idea of extending God's grace to others. We receive his grace, and then we are to pass it on. We are to be gracious people to others. And, and as I was working on that, I said, man, there's some verse somewhere about don't let anybody fail of the grace of God. It, it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness develops. Now, that's a whole other sermon. But what hit me as I was in this context of grace is... Let's make sure that we treat other people in such a way that we are not the reason they give why they don't believe in God. You know, don't let anyone fail of the grace of God. In other words, treat other people so that they will understand something of God's grace. Most of us probably have had those people in our lives where we thought, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want anything to do with it. It, it, it always hurts my heart, sounds so <laughs> thing, but, but it, it hurts my heart sometimes that in places that I've worked, the people that are the loudest people claiming to be Christians have some of the worst reputations in the building of being mean and being cruel 
and being manipulative. Like, that's not what the church needs. That's not what Christianity needs. We need to make sure that if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, that we demonstrate God's grace to those people in our lives so that they don't fail of the grace of God and they don't fall short of the grace of God and they don't develop a root of bitterness. Let's live our lives graciously. God's grace should flavor our relationships. And then Peter says, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace is God's gift, but we can grow in it. We can become more gracious. We can experience more of his grace. How do we do that? Well, Peter gave us the answer to that too. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. We grow in grace through a personal knowledge of God. The more we know God, the deeper and wider our knowledge of God gets on a personal level. And that word there that he uses, through the knowledge, means a personal knowledge. Not something you read about in a book, but something you experienced for yourself. That personal knowledge of God causes us to grow in his grace. I think Paul made a very significant statement in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, when he said... I know whom I have believed. He did not say, I know what I have believed. He said, I know whom I have believed. It's the Twyla of Paris song, Do I Trust You, Lord, that we reference periodically, where she says, I, I, I've given all the answers and they don't make sense right now. What I need to know is, do I trust you, Lord? It's not what I believe. And you know that I believe you need to know what you believe. But it's who you have believed. Paul said, I'm going through all kinds of stuff, and I know whom I have believed. And he's able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. Well, preacher, how do you get to know God? You get to know God the same way you get to know anybody else. You spend time with him. <laughs> it's just that simple. You spend time with him. You spend time reading his word. You spend time talking to him in prayer. You spend time with other believers talking about God and fellowshipping around God. You, you, you just hang out with God. Learn about him. Spend time with him. You will grow in your personal knowledge of him, and you will grow in grace. But maybe I missed something. So I want to quote to you 1 Peter 5.10. The God of all grace. So whatever it is that you need today, God's grace is sufficient. Whatever challenge you're facing, whatever burden you're carrying, whatever dilemma you're in, God's grace is sufficient. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Do you ever think about prayer as grace? He said, let's go to the throne of grace. God is saying, I'm here. I have the grace you need for whatever you need. Come to my throne of grace, and I will give you what you need for this time of need. Whatever that need is, he has the grace. John chapter 1 verse 16, Of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. It was grace that has brought us to this day, and grace will lead us all the way home. And that's good news. When I was thinking about this, my mind went, and I know that I've played this song for you I don't know, three or four months ago. You've forgotten it already. <laughs> but, but Gordon Jensen wrote a song called Grace Upon Grace that he just says it's like the waves of the shore that keep coming on. Always enough, always more, 
All that we need is ours from the Lord. And a song like that with a video of the ocean <laughs> is a great combination of God's grace. Gordon Jensen's song, Grace Upon Grace, you'll find the link in the comment section or the description section. Grace Upon Grace. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his grace and his peace and all that you need through Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here today. You're dismissed.